It is really easy for us to forget what it has taken God to get us where we are. I'm speaking to believers who are mature and stable. And when we stop and we think about um, the problems that we struggled with early on in our Christian life, the things that were issues for us then that are not issues anymore, and we forget when we look at other believers that are struggling with those things, hey, I, yeah, it took me a while. It took God a while for me to grow and get past that. I'm Pastor Tim Holsher, and we are looking in the book of Romans at what it takes for God to stabilize believers. And probably one of the first issues that really creates a stabilization problem has to do with the presence of the sin nature, and we looked at that back in Romans chapters 5 through 8. We're now up into chapters, beginning with chapter 12, and we're into chapter 14, where Paul is talking about the role that those who are mature and stable can play in helping believers become stable, or even more so, not becoming a hindrance to the progress that they're making as God is working with them. We started yesterday in chapter 14, back up in verse 1, where Paul says, you just receive these believers. They're weak in the faith. They're weak in the faith because they don't know all the promises of God, and they're afraid that maybe eating meat uh, that might, accident, might have been offered to an idol, and they don't know that for sure, um, because that might have been offered to an idol, well, they're, they're afraid that might impact their relationship with God in some way that... Uh, it's going to have some negative effect. And so as a result of that, they choose to be vegetarians, not for health reasons. They're vegetarians for religious reasons. And Paul says, when we come to verse three, the one who eats. So this is the one not weak in the faith. This is the believer that's strong in the faith. This is the believer who's stable. He says, the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. It's really easy to look down at him and go, oh, oh, you silly. Oh, I remember when I had problems with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, oh good grief. You don't do that to them. It took a while for God. What would that have done to you if somebody would have mocked you or treated you with contempt? Because you were growing and you were a young believer and those things, there were things that were issues to you that you didn't know about. You didn't know how those things might affect your Christian life. And so as Paul talks about this, he says, first of all, those of you that are mature, the first thing you can do to not impede their progress is don't treat them with contempt. They're brothers. Receive them. Don't bicker and argue with them over these matters and don't treat them with contempt. But then he does address... He does address in the last part of the verse those who, who um, are weak in the faith. He says the one who does not eat, he says, is not to judge the one who eats. Now, the reason he judges them is he's going, you ate that meat offered to an idol, that might have been offered to an idol, Psh, up, that's going to hurt you. That's going to mess up your relationship with God. And I don't exactly know how we think of that. Let me put it in, in my own personal experience that I've struggled with the fact that, hey, if I did something wrong, if I did something that wasn't what I knew God wanted me to do, it was very easy for me then to think, well, I can't go talk to God now. I got to wait 10 minutes. I got to wait a half hour. It's been, it's only been an hour. I probably shouldn't go talk to God yet because I, you know, I did that thing or Maybe even yesterday I did that, and I probably got, why would God want to talk to me? See, that's the very problem that this creates, is that in some way, we think that we have been or might be separated from God's love, and that God doesn't give us access into his presence, and that we can't really rest at his right hand. And we do that because we think that our actions have negatively impact that relationship. It's really, it's really a failure to really appreciate and understand the grace of God. And it takes most of us as believers a while to come to really understand and appreciate God's grace in the present tense. Oh, we usually got it in the past, but it's, what, it's how God's grace affects us now as well as the future that we just, 
we struggle with tremendously. We, add, we bring so many works into this. And so Paul says here, don't judge him. He's telling that believer that has, that's weak in the faith and is struggling, he says, don't, don't judge your brother. Don't judge the brother who's eating. He says, for God accepted him. And that word accepted him is the same word, is this the word accepted, it's the same word proslambano that Paul used back in verse 1 where he tells those that are mature in the faith to receive those who are weak in the faith. He didn't receive you on, on a contingency plan. We're going to check it out. Uh, you're, you're, we're waiting for you to prove yourself. No, Christ just receives you. You believe in him, that's it. Settled. It's done. Furthermore, he makes this astounding promise in verse 4 that I find very few Christians ever come to appreciate. Who are you to judge the servant of another? You're looking. You're a servant in the household. Who are you then judging these, these other servants? They're not your servants. They're God's servants. They're Christ's servants. Who are you to be judging them? He goes on. He says, to his own master... He stands or falls. And of course, when you're judging him, you're going, well, he's going to fall. But that then Paul comes right behind that. And he says, and he will stand. Doesn't say he might stand. He says, he will stand. Why? For the Lord is able to make him stand. That's the key in all of this. Really, even in your present tense salvation, salvation is still God's work. You work out your own salvation but God is actually the one who is saving us. He saved me in the past, still saving me, and he will save me. And as a result, guess what? No matter what a person may or may not be doing as part of their Christian life, they stand because the Lord is able to make him stand. Wow, that is an astounding promise. Astounding. And I hope that that encourages you today. Maybe you're the immature believer. Maybe you're still struggling with, well, can I eat just anything? Paul says, I can. Paul says, over when he writes Timothy, one of the last letters uh, <clears throat> that he writes in his life, he tells Timothy, <clears throat> nothing is to be refused. Nothing is to be refused. When he writes to Corinthians, he says, idols, they're nothing. Oh, but he says, but they are kind of something to those that think there's something in their minds. So for their sake, be cautious because we don't want to run roughshod over those people and we want to be a good testimony towards the unsaved. But as he's talking here about the issue of stability, he's encouraging the stable believer, don't treat that brother with contempt. And the brother who is lack stability don't judge the brother who actually can and does these things. Don't judge him because he will stand. He will stand because the Lord will make him stand. Not stand shaking and tottering, knees knocking. Stand. Stand with probably what we would say would be some firmness, some stability as Paul begins this letter <clears throat> and will end this letter. Think about that today. The Lord will make you stand. Your brothers, the Lord will make them stand. That's his work. Thank him for that. Appreciate the greatness of his grace. And with that, have a good day in the Lord. Thank you for joining me today.